Everybody, everybody recovered from uh, Christmas? Everybody recovered from that? <laughs> oh boy, boy, oh boy, did we eat well. Did we have some great, great, uh, great Christmas. I'd like to encourage you to be uh, thinking to share uh, your greatest uh, reason to praise God or what you enjoyed most about this Christmas that you had, okay? Uh, this specific, particular one a couple of days ago. Uh, we're going to give thanks for that. Just share a little bit from the with the congregation, okay? So, uh, be thinking about that. I've already got mine uh, ready. But a couple of things to be reminded of: opportunities for church family life, and these are in your bulletins. But did want to highlight them a little bit. Our folks online that uh, get this may not uh, may not have uh, this particular lineup here. But if you're not regularly attending our Sunday school or morning discipleship classes and Bible classes and fellowship, uh, I'd like to encourage you to consider doing that. Maybe for the new year, not as a new resolution, but just something. This is what I wanted to do for a long time. I've thought about it. Uh, so maybe uh, this new year, uh, considering being a part of one of our uh, morning Bible study groups here on, at Christ E Free Church. Um, also, please remember... Wednesday mornings at 10, we have our prayer and Bible study gathering here at the church, and it's a small group, but uh, we do uh, meet together, and we encourage you, if you're interested in being a part of that, um, give us a call or show up Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Great time of prayer, great time of Bible study, and we're going through all of the intercessory prayers that we can find in Scripture, which has been uh, encouraging. So that's Wednesdays at, at 10. And then something that we all need to have on our calendars is January the 11th will be our next congregational meeting. I have that right, Sam? The 11th. Uh, so January the 11th is our next congregational meeting, our business meeting for our church family. Uh, please put that on your calendar to be a part of that because every person's input, every person's prayer, every person's presence uh, is important. Uh, at those business meetings. All right. Everybody love the snow? I love it. I love it. Never got enough of it growing up. Love this snow. And I love it when we can get together like this in worship. I'm thankful for our freedoms. Are you that we still have our freedoms and uh, we still have the freedom to meet, to part with too much restrictions, and I'm certainly thankful that our governor has still given us that much freedom. Praise the Lord for that. Well, I'd like to invite you to stand with me. If you're up to it, we'll unite our hearts in prayer and continue our, our worship, our offering of worship to the Lord together. Our Father, we uh, gather this morning in freedom, and we're thankful for that. National freedom. Lord, we're thankful for that. Lord, we're mindful of other believers around the world who do not share the freedoms that we have. Yet they continue to worship and meet and gather as they can. 
many of them suffering persecution because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus in their lives. Lord, we thank you that we have such brothers and sisters around the world, such a diverse and broad church family. Lord, we pray your special blessings upon the body of Christ around the world. Thankful, we're thankful that we're a part of that. Help us to remember our brothers and sisters and even their suffering as though it were our very own. We thank you also, Lord, for the reason that we do have to praise you during Christmas every day, every season. And yet our focus is on the Lord's birth, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for all that means to us. Thank you for our uh, Christmas celebrations uh, this week, Lord. But for now, at this place, at this time, Lord, we want to open our hearts to you today. We want to extend an open invitation for your Holy Spirit to come in and stir this place, start with every individual heart, stir our hearts, stir up the praise, Lord, that's in every one of us, that we might give you the offering of worship that you alone are worthy to receive. We love you, Lord, and may you continue to be honored and glorified with the offering of thanksgiving and praise that we bring in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you for that beautiful song. This one, touching. Um, I'm going to go to praises here, as Jeff was saying, if you have a you know, praise about the Christmas season. I just want to share something uh, uh, I heard over the holidays. This church, uh, the kids were going to do a uh, Christmas play. And this one boy was the innkeeper, like I was in the last light of Bethlehem. And uh, they told him, you only have one line. And just say, no room, be gone. And so uh, the play went on, and uh, his part was signed for him. And he goes, um, and they came, and he says, no, be gone. And, but then he, he, he says, but wait. This wasn't in the script. He says, but wait. I have my room, you can have my room. And, and some people were thought about, well, this isn't right, but this little boy opened his room, his heart, to Jesus, as we all should, uh, and so it was pretty cool. It turned out really nice. So. I was thinking about 2020, and a lot of people are saying, I'm glad to see it ending. <laughs> and I think many of us have similar thoughts. It hasn't been the best year, has it? But yet there are a lot of things we can be thankful for too. I was thinking as I looked down over this list, Nigeria, 2,200 Christians slain in the last year. We don't have that in America, do we? Aren't you thankful for that? We have freedom to be in the house of the Lord today. So we have many things for which we can give thanks. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We have so much to thank you for. Many things during this year have not been all that we would like them to have been. But we're so thankful, Lord, that we have you as our strong arm to lean on our refuge, our strength, our very present help in every time of need. You're there for us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that we have that assurance, and we have that same assurance for 2021. You're not going to leave us. You're not going to forsake us. You will be there for us, and we thank you for that promise. And now, Lord, it's our privilege to bring before you the requests that are on our hearts today. Hear us as we call on your name on behalf of these that have special needs. We pray for Bev English, Lord, who is still recovering from her fall. Visit that home today with your presence. May she sense and feel you ministering in a very special way on her behalf. Thank you, Lord, for touching her even while we're praying here. And we also pray that for Margaret and Ed, home recovering from COVID. Lord, just be with them. Be their strength. Minister in a very special way to that need. We want to remember Uncle Joe in prayer, 87 years old, and in the hospital with COVID. Lord, would you visit that hospital room right now and minister that strength and that touch that comes from above. We pray, Lord, for Ted's brother, Troy, who's gone through so much with the bone marrow cleansing and now adding to that the kidney stones and borderline pneumonia. But thank you, Lord, that he was home. He's home now. Thank you. Would you continue to visit him with your presence and with that healing touch? We're believing, God, that you're going to work and move in a special way. Be with George Dingledine as tomorrow is his surgery on his other eye. We ask, God, that you would just be present with him, take away any anxiousness that might be there, give the doctors wisdom and guidance and direction. And Lord, when this procedure is completed, might he be able to see better than he's ever seen for a long time. We're thanking you, Lord, for ministering to that need and meeting him in a very special way. We pray, Lord, for the many that are dealing with financial issues at this season of the year, job issues, health issues, various kinds of hardships. 
We ask, God, that you would minister to them in a very special way, thanking you, Lord, thanking you for working. We place our country in your hands during this season of the year, asking you, O oh God, to minister in a very special way. O oh God, we place the election, we place the future of our country in your all-powerful hands. Send a revival to America, we pray. Break through, break through, Lord. Hear the prayers and the cries of your people on behalf of this nation, and might we see victory in the, in the months to come. We'll thank you, Lord. We'll give you praise. We would remember our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. Oh God, we have no idea what this is like to live under this constant threat. We thank you, Lord, that they're willing to stand strong and true in the midst of the severe persecution. But Lord, we pray that even this very day, they will sense your strength being made perfect in their weakness. Give them, Lord, wisdom, direction, and guidance, and we'll thank you. We ask you to be present with us in a very special way in the remainder of this service. Give us ears to hear what you have for us from your holy word, we pray. We'll thank you. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 6, if you would, today. Matthew chapter 6, as we continue with the Sermon on the Mount, focus on the Sermon on the Mount. I never cease, uh, everybody okay? <laughs> I never cease to be amazed how uh, these lessons from 2,000 years ago from the Sermon on the Mount are so relevant to us today and so applicable to our situation today 2,000 years later. It doesn't seem like something that old would really have much to do with us, but it does. And uh, so God's word is timeless, right? Doesn't kind of go in and out of uh, vogue or in and out of style or in and out of relevancy, but it is always relevant. This year, and don't shout out, this is not like the praise time, don't shout out your answers, okay? But, but this year, what have you really worried about the most? Think about that, what comes to your mind. What was the outcome of the things you worried about the most? I would venture to say most of the things kind of came and went without whatever it is we were worrying about, the worst thing happening, probably. But lastly, how did it affect your life as a whole, what you worried about? How did it affect your mental or emotional health? How did it affect your relationships with others? Typically, worry does not positively affect our mental health, our emotional health, or even our relationships for that matter. So we're picking up today, we looked briefly at the issue of anxiety last week. Jesus kind of starts that in chapter 6. But this is just sort of free for you, for what it's worth. When we think of anxiety, some people say, oh, I'm not, I don't, nothing bothers me. I'm not, I'm not anxious about anything. You ever talk to people like that? They're just on cloud nine all the time, you know. Uh, but here's, here's my thought. This is, this is from Jeff's philosophy. Um, anxiety is a bit like body odor. Anxiety is a bit like body odor. You may think you don't smell, but those around you know you do. <laughs> and you may not think you're anxious. You may not think you suffer from anxiety, but sometimes those around us know you do. Because it affects our temperament, right? It affects 
our view on life. It affects our perceptions of what you might say, and I might take it wrong because I'm anxious or whatever. And it affects a lot. It affects our mental health. It affects our emotional health. It can affect our relationships. I think some people think a stick of deodorant in the medicine cabinet is there for decoration. Matches perfectly the inside of my medicine chest. So why move it? Why use it? I'm liable to use it up. So we keep it there because it, it matches. And that's all they ever do with it. They think, I don't know. I don't need deodorant. But the people around us know, you do. So with anxiety, with anxiety, we think we, think we keep it all up here, all of our anxious thoughts. All of our worries, it stays, it stays in here. When really on the outside, people around us know that we're suffering from something. Maybe just can't put their finger on it. Something's bothering us. Something's troubling us. And it affects others. And they can oftentimes sense it. Just like you can smell body odor. You just wonder, how can I bring that up? It is an awkward thing to bring up, isn't it? Body odor, anxiety. Things like that. Matthew chapter 6. That's just, a, that's just free of charge today. Uh, it will kind of apply once we kind of get going looking at anxiety. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 and following is where we'll pick up. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If you have your bulletin today, on the front of it, the title for today's message is Faith Questions for a Favorable Future. Faith Questions for a Favorable Future. This is not pop psychology. This is not even Jeff's psychology. Okay, this didn't come from me. Uh, but these are questions, and we're going to be focusing on these questions in this passage of Scripture that Jesus asks in the context of anxiety. We're going to be focusing on four questions. We won't go through all of them today. But I just want to give you a heads up for, the, for the, today. The first point we're going to look at today is the problem with anxiety. The problem with anxiety, the prescription for anxiety, which Jesus gives us, and then the promise with anxiety. Those are the things we're going to be looking at as our main points. Four questions, three main points. We begin with the problem of anxiety. What are the worst things you've worried about this year? How have they affected you and how have they affected our relationships? And what was the outcome of those things you worried at, worried about? The problem with anxiety, the problem with anxiety is that it is a thief. You with me? It is a thief. It will steal everything in your life that maybe you can't touch it, but the things that are most valuable to your life, your hope, your peace, your joy, your strength, your encouragement, maybe even erode your faith. Thief has the ability to steal all of those things if we let it, if we let him. Matthew 6, 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Thank you, Jesus. What a, what a statement, how easy it is to make that statement how difficult it is sometimes to deal with that anxiety. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. 
<clears throat> is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. <clears throat> so anxiety is a what? Thief. Thief. Okay, I thought I was going to go, have to go through that whole five minutes all over again. <laughs> anxiety is a thief, but guess what? Anxiety never works alone. Anxiety never works works alone. Once anxiety gets access into your life, into your house, guess what he does? He calls his buddies. Hey, guess what? I gained access to this place over here. The door is wide open. You wouldn't believe it. Come on in. Let's ransack his place. Loot it. Pillage it. Come on. Hurry. Everybody come back. Come in. Because anxiety doesn't come in all alone. Anxiety finds a way in calls up his buddies and say, hey, easy pickings. There's a lot to take from this house. And so his buddies come in. And we'll get to those buddies in just a minute. Anxiety. What is anxiety? And I would say no one is exempt from it. Here's a working definition of anxiety. The inability to set aside a worry over an upcoming event or an uncertain outcome. Anxiety is a sense, a feeling based on what we might or could, what might or could occur in the future, but it is not a reality, but based on apparent possibilities. Did you hear all the ifs? in those definitions. The inability to set aside a worry over an upcoming event or uncertain outcome. We're not exactly sure what it is, but we're uncertain about it, so we're worrying about it. It's based on what might or could occur in the future, if or if, but it's not a reality, but based on apparent possibilities. That's kind of the working definition of anxiety. Some synonyms for anxiety. <clears throat> An unceasing or increasing stress. Worry, apprehension, consternation. Sounds like an abdominal problem, doesn't it? I'm suffering from consternation today. Yeah, we knew that by the look on your face. Consternation, apprehension, all of these things are thieves that come in and rob us of our hope, our encouragement, our peace, our joy, and can ever even begin to erode our faith. Anxiety comes in and he calls up, hey guys, come on, follow me in here. Easy pickings. Easy pickings. And so he brings, he brings his back up. He brings his buddies to loot and to pillage. Everything good that you and I have in our heart and our life that God desires to be overflowing. But anxiety whisks it away. Some antonyms or opposites of anxiety. Confidence. Certainty. Peace. There's something God wants us, the devil doesn't want us to have, right? Peace. Hope. Boy, if the devil can get, get rid of that, if he can call his homeboys in and say, hey, they got way too much hope here. Come in and help me. I need help carrying all this out. Security, assurance, those are things that God wants us to have. And these are things that anxiety and all of his backup can come in and loot and pillage out of your spiritual life. So when anxiety comes in, into a life, he has many close associates and connections that he often calls in for backup to help out. Ezekiel 4.16, you can just jot this down. And he said to me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in, in, in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and they shall drink water by measure and in despair. Despair is an associate of anxiety, a close associate. They do business together. 
where there's anxiety, there's often despair. Where there is despair, it was often anxiety that opened the door and let him in. Anxiety and despair or a sense of hopelessness. Isaiah 35, verse 4. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and with recompense. He will come and save you. An associate of an anxious heart is fear or terror is the word there. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Ah, pull our hair out. We worry. We bite our nails. Pull out our hair. Have ulcers. Whatever happens. What else happens when we get sick? Or I mean, when we get anxious? I'm not sure. But all those things. It's interesting, isn't it? What comes in the thoughts here affect us here, our abdomen, our physical heart, our blood pressure. What else? Motivation. I mean, if anxiety gets in there and, and is allowed to stay, wow, man, he can get a lot done. He can get a lot of damage done for the evil one, right? Boy, and that's, that's a great tool, a great tool of Satan. Those are some of the associates of anxiety, despair or hopelessness, fear or terror. Fear will keep us from doing anything for the Lord. Fear will, will, will become all-consuming. Oh, I, I can't serve the Lord. I, I'm just too tore up inside. I, I, I can't even think about ministry. I'm just, I'm just a mess. And that can just kind of, that can, I know for a fact, that can just absolutely overwhelm and become all-encompassing, all-encompassing all in a person's life. All-consuming. Anxiety, fear, terror, hopelessness. Despair. Despair. Anxiety is, is like a smoke screen of confusion. It brings all these other things in so that we can't see what God wants for us. We can't see what God wants to do for us. Maybe we can't see how God wants to use us. And so anxiety can be a great smoke screen to keep us cloudy, keep us confused, keep us from seeing or doing what God wants us, wants us to do. When I was a kid, uh, on the 4th of July, we used to go out and get smoke bombs. <clears throat> By the way, just a disclaimer, don't try this at home. You know, don't, just small children, let them leave the room now. But we would get smoke bombs, and they would just look just exactly like cherry bombs. I don't know who came up with that idea to make them both look alike. But you had cherry bombs, which were really a little tiny bomb. Some of you, how many of you know what a cherry bomb is? Okay, cherry bomb, dangerous. How many kids lost fingers because of those things? But a smoke bomb looked exactly like it, except a cherry bomb was red, and a smoke bomb was usually purple in color. However, at night, on the 4th of July, you often couldn't tell the difference. But we liked to... My gang, I guess, we like to ride our bikes on the 4th of July and we would acquire smoke bombs. And we like to go down to the supermarket where cars were parked and we like to light a smoke bomb and let it off and just roll it underneath the car and bicycle away and find a place to sit and just watch the mayhem that erupted <laughs> from a smoke bomb. It was harmless, you know. I mean, it was just smoke is all it was, a smoke screen. But people thought the worst. They panicked. You know, panic, there was havoc. Bedlam, we, we loved seeing Bedlam for some reason. Havoc. Hysteria was something we loved to see take place because of those smoke bombs. We would go by a grocery store somewhere and toss a lit smoke bomb into the dumpster or the garbage can and just pedal off somewhere and just watch the... I know you're thinking, how did we get this guy for a pastor? <laughs> Yes, I should have been in jail. I agree with you. I probably should have been in jail for a lot worse than that. And we would love to just watch people in the society respond to the smoke screens and things like that. We'd go up on people's doors and set off a smoke bomb and knock on the door and run off and laugh at people because they thought they, they thought their front porch was on fire. 
I know, Olivia, you're just absolutely devastated that uh, to learn this about me, right? Of all the days to come home, you had to hear this. Yeah, but, but that was, but you know what? There wasn't anything going on, really. It was just a smoke screen. It kept people confused. It distracted them. It made them think the very worst, right? It made them think the worst when really nothing was really happening of much importance. But boy, did we get a kick out of it. And I think the devil uses anxiety, a lot of things like that. He'll, he'll, he'll find a way to get anxiety to enter into our life. And it's like a smoke screen. It, may, it just makes us, it confuses us, it fogs us, distracts us, derails us. And all we can see is the smoke. All we can focus on is our anxiety. And we become paralyzed. Spiritually speaking, ministerially speaking, motivationally speaking, we just become paralyzed. And so, as you think about this, you wonder, wow, I guess anxiety is really a bigger issue than what I originally thought of. Well, you think, why Jesus, we almost think Jesus, why is Jesus wasting his time just talking about Anxiety, You know, isn't that a modern day problem? Well, no. And so Jesus talks about, and he addresses the issue of anxiety. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about anything. This is the problem with anxiety. For don't be anxious about your life, about what you'll eat, about what you will drink, about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? We sort of touched on this last Sunday. And it seems that Jesus, when we talked about that, is life more than food and the body more than clothing. Eating, drinking, clothing, what we're going to put on, what we're going to put into our bodies. It seems like Jesus is referring to a contrast here between the temporary earthly distractions of human life as opposed to our earthly, heavenly, spiritual life that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. And if we don't have faith in Jesus Christ, as far as I'm concerned, we got nothing. We may think we have things, things parked in our garage, things de don't, uh, deposited in our bank account, things that we can hold and show people. But if you don't have faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord, one of the most horrible things that can happen from my perspective is for people who have no faith in Christ to be satisfied with this life. They are content with life as it is. What a dangerous thing that is. I have been there and I have done that. How dangerous it is to think I've got all I want. Seems like all I need. My banking, you know, my paycheck from, you know, from my interest on my money at one point was more than my buddies were making in a month from their jobs. And I thought, this is incredible. Felt like I had no need of anything else or anybody else, much less God. And so Jesus asks, faith question number one, we're finally getting to the first one. Faith questions for a favorable future. Here's faith question number one. And I, I, term, I, I refer to it this way. That Jesus, as he is kind of dealing with this issue of anxiety, he asks these questions. And I always look for questions in the Bible. Because they're not there because the person writing it down doesn't know the answer. But I feel like God's, he, he, the Holy Spirit inspires people to put these questions in there because when we read it, it gets us to thinking. When God said to Adam, Adam, where are you? It wasn't like God had no idea where Adam was. It was just making Adam think about it. And Adam's question was, I'm here hiding from you behind this bush. I think God just wanted Adam to think that through and come to that silly conclusion himself. And so we have these questions that are very valuable to answer. So faith question number one in verse 25. 
Jesus says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And remember we talked earlier about the, the brevity of human physical life as opposed to the length of eternal life. And everybody's going to live eternally somewhere. Eternal life is not just for those who believe in Jesus. We'll all live eternally somewhere. Some with the Lord, some separated from the Lord. So is not, is not life, and I think this is what Jesus is getting at, is not life, the, where you are now in all of eternity, is not like is not this earthly life, just about food and drinking and clothing. Well, that's a big part of it. If you're looking at needs, yes, what you're going to drink, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, shelter, yep, that covers, that pretty well covers it. You would be tempted to say, well, yes. If we, were, if we were just focused on the physical, temporary, earthly, worldly life. But I believe Jesus is referring to all of life. This life, the next life, is all of your life. Isn't it more than just what you eat and drink and put on your body? Where you park your car? Is it not more than all of that? And I think Jesus uses food, clothing, and drink here to basically be representative of all of the things we worry about. Because frankly, basically everything we worry about is earthly focused, right? I mean, when it comes down to it. Not that there's not a spiritual aspect to it, but we're worried about our loved ones who are sick, our church members who had the COVID. We're worried about our relatives. We're worried about, you know, all kinds of things. We're worried about the elections. We're worried about, you know, who was really guilty of the COVID thing. Now I'm hearing Africa was stood up and said, hey, we, we're responsible for it. I think I'd have kept my mouth shut if I was Africa. But, but I think he's saying, is not all of your life the most important aspects of your life, more than these little Things and they're big to us in this world, but these things that worry us and cause us anxiety and they rob us of our hope, our peace, our joy, our strength, our encouragement, our purpose, our motivation, perhaps is somewhat effective and even eroding our faith a little bit. Well, if that's what God's like, you know. This life. This life is not life more than all these things. Is not your entire spiritual life, eternal life, more than just these temporary things that tend to distract you or worry you or cause you consternation that paralyzes us. This life is our eternal existence as opposed to anything earthly we might want or think we deserve. Anxiety. Boy, the devil is, does a good job with what he does. He knows how to distract us and, and how to get us off track and how to paralyze us. Even as Christians, he knows how to, how to get us so really self-focused, not on things that aren't important, but they got no business being all-consuming. So what are some things that can cause consternation? Worry? Anxiety? Violence in our country? The uncertainty as to what's going to happen next with the COVID. We're going to get shut down again. The business is going to get shut down again. Or all the church is going to get shut down we worry about family problems, difficulties, relationships in our family, strained relationships in our family. We wonder about our comfort, our preferences, our expectations, our dreams, our hopes. And I believe Jesus is saying, is not life, all of your life as a believer in Christ, is not all of your life more important than any one of these issues that cause us such anxiety? The danger or the greater problem with anxiety is that once he comes in, 
He doesn't work alone. He calls his buddies, brings them in, and they loot and they pillage your life. The Bible says Satan, or the evil one, has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal what God has given you or wants to give you. He wants to kill whatever God wants to bring to life in your life. He wants to destroy all that God wants to do and to build up and accomplish through your life. If it can just bring in some anxiety, other things, but our focus is on anxiety. If you just get that in the crack in the door, then anxiety will do the rest. He'll just push that door wide open and get on the phone, call his buddies and call for backup. And it doesn't take long to make us a total wreck. A total wreck. With that, I want to say this. I think the greatest uh, anxiety that we might experience, and again, this is the worst part, is if people aren't sure of their eternal destiny and yet aren't anxious about it. I told you I like to ask people questions. What does Advent mean to you? I like to ask people the, these, these five questions. Is there a God? And this is these are questions I ask people because no matter what their answer is, you don't have to argue with them because it's irrelevant as far as the this process. If I say, is there a God? They can say whatever they want to. They can disagree that there's a God. They can say, no, I'm atheist, whatever. Second question is, but if there was a God, what does he expect of you? And I've had people say, I'm atheist. I hate God. Don't talk to me about God. You know, blah, blah, blah. But when I get to the second question, but if there was a God, what does he expect of you? All of a sudden, hmm, that makes them think. If there was a God, what is he expecting? Is there life after death? Yes, no, maybe so. Well, if there was life after death, how could you prepare for it? Hmm. Interesting. But I remember one guy at work when I was welding the machine shop, I asked him that question. I had them all lined up in my mind. As soon as he answers, Question number one, pow. Question number two, you know. And then pow, I'm going to give him question number three. Question number five was the clincher, you know. But I said, so, do you believe there's a God? Yeah, I think so. Then what does he expect of you? He says, I don't know and I don't care. Really? I wasn't ready for that. In my mind... My mind doesn't grasp somebody who believes there's a God but doesn't care about what he expects of you. Or if somebody believes, yeah, I believe there's life after death. We may define it differently. Well, then how do you prepare for it? Don't know and don't care. Well, you know, eternity is a long, long time. So wouldn't it make sense if we spent this this little brief part of human existence researching and preparing to stand before God and to experience that life after death, whatever it could be. Where will you spend eternity? People who aren't anxious about that trouble me if they don't know. Where will you spend eternity? If you die tonight, D. James Kennedy used to say, if you die tonight, where would you spend eternity? People might say, oh, I made, I made things right with the man upstairs. That, that, that offers me no hope for anybody. That's an evasion, avoidance technique about fo focusing on Jesus. Oh, I made my peace with my situation. Really? How did you how do you do that? How did how have you done that? Peace with what? Peace with who? How do you get that peace with your situation? How do you how do you bargain or barter or work that out with circumstances? I don't know that that can be done. 
Or, I know I'm going to a better place. Okay, could you fill me in a little bit more? What is the place and how do you know that? What, what has changed? What are you basing that on? Or here's one, I've worked hard at being good. Haven't we all? Don't we all think that? So I want you to think about, have you worked hard enough to be good enough to get to heaven, to stand before God, to prepare for life after death? I've worked hard at being good. There was a husband who was asked about his relationship with his wife. He says, have you ever slapped your wife? He said, yes, I slap her every day. This guy's like, okay. He said, uh, do you ever treat her nice? He says, yep. He says, I clean the house. I do the dishes. I walk the dog. I cut the grass. And I come, in, come in right in and slap my wife. And what does this accomplish? He said, it makes up, all these things make up, make up for slapping my wife. Does she care? I don't know. She's just thankful that I do all those things, that I'm good and do all those things. I try awfully hard. Now, how utterly absurd does that sound to you? That was actually written as a cartoon at one point, but it's not very funny, is it? Because you know what? Some people think about God that way. I work hard. I still live the way I want to live, even though it may not be pleasing to God. I do what I want to do, and I slap God in the face as I do it, and I still keep living the way I've always lived. But I'm right with him. He knows me. We've got this thing going on. He knows, you know. I know those sound sarcastic, but those are the excuses that I've been given from people. So I want to ask you today, have you trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior? You know, Christmas without the crucifixion is just idolatry. It's just idolizing a baby, a cute baby. That's not what Christmas is about. Jesus said, I came or I was born to seek and to save that which was lost. And that is every one of us. We are separated from God because of our sins. And our sins deserve death. The payment for sin is death. But Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and took your punishment for your sins and, uh, and your payment for your sins. And he did it himself for us in our place so that we wouldn't have to. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for me, for you, for all who put their faith in him. That is how we do what God expects of us. Not work harder but to believe in his son that he sent, Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's how we prepare for life after death. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You will be prepared to enter into life after death. So much that he's done. Christmas really points us towards the crucifixion, ultimately, and the resurrection of Jesus. Apart from that, it's kind of an empty story, really. So have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Have you trusted Jesus that through believing in Him, His death on Calvary paid for your sin and He took your punishment? I'd like to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. And yes, we will get to the rest of these faith questions at our next gatherings. But Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here, Lord, that's ignored or neglected, uh, coming to faith, putting their faith in Jesus, God's only Son is their only Savior. Lord, I pray that today they would be a little anxious about their eternal destiny. And I pray that they would be anxious enough that they would Trust Christ fully and firmly as their Savior. That when you died and shed your blood, it was for them so they could be forgiven. As you died on Calvary, you were allowing each of us to be reconciled to God, our Heavenly Father. 
And as you died on Calvary and shed your blood so that all who believed in Jesus could spend eternity with him in his home. I pray that each of you would be trusting in Jesus today. In his name we ask, amen. And this is going out on uh, Facebook and to other uh, people through email videos. Uh, if you have a prayer need, please uh, reply to this email. If you can, reply to it and uh, let us know how we can be praying for you. We'd love to hear uh, from you about it. Also, our church's website is www.christefca.org. And on that website are a lot of free resources about salvation, about uh, spiritual life, and things like that. It's all free. Uh, so um, uh, we encourage you to utilize that resource.